for the parents, say you're a single mom or single dad, okay. um, which is already like, there's going to be some stress in that. How do you help your kid to not develop this nice guy syndrome? The best way I know to do that is through modeling. And, and probably you're aware of that, that, you, you know, if your, your yeah. daughter, if your daughter sees you doing certain things, she'll probably model it. You know, most they, they say, for example, yes. most, most children that smoke grew up seeing adults smoke or, you know, most that develop drinking issues saw adults. Now, that's not always the case, but our children model our behavior for good and for bad. So if going back to what I was talking about of you filling your own bucket up, for example, if your daughter sees you consciously surrounding yourself with lots of resources, those cooperative reciprocal relationships I was talking about, where it's you and your friends, it's you and professionals that you have in your life, your doctor, your dentist, your chiropractor, your accountant, your co you know, co-workers, and you are consciously getting what you need to fill your bucket from those resources as you also give you and i right now have a cooperative reciprocal relationship we both agreed to be here we both assume we'll get something a benefit out of being here together and you know if after we're said and done if either one of us decided that wasn't worth the time or investment we probably wouldn't do it again but if, if both of us felt like hey that was worthwhile that that was beneficial we, we would de very definitely consider doing that again. That's what a cooperative reciprocal relationship is. So if your daughter, for example, sees you spending time with your girlfriends, uh, exercising, eating healthy, meditating, going for walks in the park, laughing, having fun, um, surrounding yourself with goodness that fills your life, fills your bucket, then you're giving to her from the overflow, and she will then model those same behaviors. Um, a, good, a good model for this is um, a guy named uh, M. Scott Peck wrote a book called The Road Less Traveled. Uh, it's probably 40 years old. I've, I've heard it's the all-time best-selling self-help book. And um, there's a whole chapter in there on discipline, I mean, a whole section, a whole a section on love. And he says love, I'm going to paraphrase it, is the giving to oneself or to another in a way that promotes one's or another's spiritual growth. Now, you could also just say well-being, okay? And he says, and, and I teach this in a lot of my, my programs, he, he has this really cool model that I've expanded on. He says, if the, if the parents are meeting their needs in, in a timely, judicious way, filling their own bucket up, if they have healthy, differentiated relationship with each other to where, where mom and dad aren't in what I call an ownership fused relationship, which is you belong to me, therefore you should constantly fill my bucket up because I feel so empty. That's how most of us do our intimate relationships. But if our partner is just one more of our cooperative reciprocal relationships, just one of many bucket fillers that we have in our life, and we're one for them as well, both mom and dad's buckets are going to be filled. And then Peck says, if the parents can then um, take the time to pay attention to each of their child's needs and respond to their needs in timely and judicious ways, and I add consistent to that list because I think consistency is a real important key. So if you as a mom are filling your own bucket, you're surrounded with good resources to, to keep your bucket full, to keep you energized. You can then pay attention to you. You'll have time to pay attention to your daughter. You'll see what her own particular needs are in any given moment. You'll give to them in timely ways. You'll give to her in judicious ways. And as I'm sure you've already found out, giving judiciously to our children requires the, the wisdom of Solomon. You know, um, <laughs> you know, do you give your 11 year old, wait, wait till she's, it'll probably come before 11. It'll probably happen at nine. Maybe it's already happened. She comes so says, mom, I need an iPhone. You know, I, you know, I, I need an like iPhone. Like a two. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I need an iPhone. And, and you know, your 11 year old doesn't need an iPhone because yeah. it's, it's probably not good for her to have an iPhone, but maybe every one of her friends has an iPhone and you don't want her to feel left out and not a part. And, oh, what do you do with that? I mean, those are, those yeah. are it seems like a not that important decision, but those are the important decisions of judicious giving to your children. So, so you, if, you, if you're giving to your child judiciously and consistently, Peck says that a child internalizes at the emotional level. So we're going back to talking about our emotional internalization, our emotional operating system. The child will internalize, I am important, I'm, I'm lovable, I'm valuable, 
That's number one. Number two, my needs are important. And number three, that the world is like my family. Now, if that doesn't happen, if children don't get their uh -huh. needs met in timely judicious way, they internalize the opposite. I'm not, I'm not lovable, valuable, or important. My needs are not important. And the world is like my family. So they're going to go out into the world treating, interacting with the world like nobody's going to love me or meet my needs unless I like give to them first or, or you know, use whatever my survival mechanism is. But there's one more internal belief system that children develop if their parents are not doing a very effective job of meeting their own needs and then giving to the child in timely, judicious, consistent ways. Often a parent will use the child to come meet some of their needs, emotional needs, social needs, needs for physical connection. And when a child is used to meet a parent's need, it's called parentification, the child will always believe that they're not good enough. Because remember, children are, are, are grandiose and, and narcissistic and egotistical. If mom is sad and leaning on their child, the child thinks I should make mom not sad. But because mom is sad and sad in ways that a child can't fix and continues to be sad, the child internalizes, I'm not good enough. I can't make mom be not sad. I can't make dad not be angry. So the child also develops that fourth belief system, I'm not good enough, and then goes out into the world and interacts with the world thinking, I'm not valuable, I'm not lovable, my needs aren't important, and I'm not good enough. But going back to your question, if you've been consistently, judiciously, timely meeting your daughter's needs, not perfectly by any means, but just, you know, shooting to, for, you know, being good enough, your child will internalize the belief system. I'm valuable, I'm important, my needs are important. And as I go out into the world, as I go to preschool, as I go to kindergarten, as I go to school, as I start dating in junior high, as I, you know, on and on, I'm gonna believe that I'm valuable, my needs are important, and the world is going to respond in kind. And I don't know about you, but I, I think about that at times. What would it have been like to have been in junior high thinking, I'm valuable, I'm lovable, my needs are important, and everybody else recognizes that. I'm thinking how, how, how powerful that would be. And so that's how, you, how we raise our children to develop this internalized system where they don't have to be using their defense mechanisms or survival mechanisms or covert contracts. Now, we're not going to get it perfect. None of us do. We yeah. all had imperfect parents. We're going to be imperfect parents. We're going to raise imperfect children. And in fact, giving yourself permission to be an imperfect parent and letting your child be an imperfect child is one of the greatest gifts that you can give them. Because I see a lot of parents nowadays, wanting their children to be perfect so they can feel like perfect parents. You know, these helicopter parents that go, you're going to study this, you're going to go to this camp and this camp and this camp, and you're going to make these grades, and you're going to go to this kind of college, you know, that helicopter parent, that's a yeah. burden on a child. It doesn't let the child differentiate and just be who they are. Maybe the child just wants to be an artist or, or play music or travel the world. But no, you're going to get into MIT. You're going to get into Stanford. You're going to make the good enough grades to get that. That, that creates also that belief in children that they're not good enough and, and they've got to be perfect to be loved. So letting your child be their imperfect self is also a great gift to give your child. You raise your kid thinking, and I'm not going to be doing this, but if you do raise your kid and they end up thinking they're not good enough, does that lead to individuals who try and be better and are more motivated and end up being more successful? Well, it depends on our definition of success. Okay, so that's a yes, good question. Yes, not happy, like maybe yeah. from the outside looking yeah. successful. Yeah, and, and that's a good question. And, and of course, we can look around and see that, and maybe we see it in ourselves, is that, yeah, there's a part <laughs> of me that, that wants to uh, achieve a certain degree of success so that, you know, I can feel good about myself and people will value me. And there, there's, there's a difference. And, and I, I think the difference is, is, is you just have to feel the difference. Um, for example, I, I got a PhD at 29 years old. And I think I was motivated. Number one, I almost dropped out of high school. High school just bored me. I was just totally lost and uninterested. Yeah. Once I quit yeah. playing sports, I lost interest. And uh, luckily, I, I, I got with some really good teachers. I got into debate and, and got into some stuff that energized me. Then all of a sudden, you know, studying and making good grades felt, felt just internal. It felt interesting. I, I wanted to apply myself. Now, well, you could try to make grades, trying to get make good grades by trying to look good or get approval or validation, 
or by the time I got to college then and through college and then through graduate okay, I school, I, I maintained about a 3.8 grade point average. And I think there was some part of me that was, yeah, I, look at me. I, I made these kind of grades, but not, not a very big part of me. Most of it just was, I can do this. This feels good. And that's what, that's the difference of how it feels. And where I'm at in life right now, I'm 65 years old. Most people start like thinking about retiring at my age. I have no interest in retiring. And I, I don't even know what that would look like. I'd still get them to do what I do. Um, and I, I got, I got nothing else that I have to prove to anybody or accomplish. And so okay. I'm purely motivated by the love of doing what I do. It just, it just excites me. I mean, just two experiences that, you know, b- before you and I started your call, your, your producer said, Robert, I read your book. It was really powerful at an, an important time in my life. I said, thank you for telling me that. That feels good, right? That, 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 that my, my ego isn't built on that, but it felt good knowing that, that I made a difference. And, and it felt good when I heard Adam Lane Smith, somebody that I don't know personally, say a really nice thing about me on your podcast. I thought, I, I, I had to turn the podcast off and just <laughs> sit with it and just sit with it and think that that was so out of left field. I didn't see that coming. And it just, cause I didn't. And I just thought, wow, that felt really good. Now I don't do what I do to try to keep getting that, you know, those nice words and nice things. I do what I do because I love what, what I do. And I'm glad that it makes a difference and has an impact on people's life. So for example, with you and your daughter, you could try, well, I'm, I'm going to do this and do this, and then she'll be a happy child, and I'll, I'll, I'll look like a good parent, and I'll, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, and that, that's that external validation kind of thing that's driven from not feeling good enough inside. But if you just enjoy the experience of being a mother with your daughter and just love to death just being a mom with her, then you're just, you're just going to be you. It's going to feel good. It's going to feel natural. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to snap at her occasionally. You're going to let her hear things you didn't wish she didn't hear. But you know what? It's okay because you know you know you're open hearted and loving towards her. It just feels different than that feeling of my child's got to get good grades. She's got to look good. She's got to make yeah. a good impression. She's got to make me look like a good mom. It just feels different, and and you you can just check inside. To, to feel the difference in it. Yeah. 